Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Data Kalata seminar series. I'm Leif Nelson, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Deb Small. In addition, we'll be joined by a set of really outstanding panelists, Bethany Burham, Lucius Caviola, Shireen Chaudhry, Giannis Evangelides, Ike Silver, and Rima Touré Tillery. In addition, we're here with Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson, uh, as with every week. Now, for those of you who haven't done this before, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. You can submit questions or comments and they will be seen by all of the panelists. Deb will be too small to presumably read them herself, uh, but don't worry, we can read them on her behalf and sometimes voice those questions to her. And even if we don't have a chance to voice it, they are all recorded. So if you just wanna make sure she gets the feedback, she will get it at the end of the talk. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, Deb, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, thanks to this great set of panelists. I, all of you have done important work, um, either related to generosity or self-promotion, or both work that's inspired me. So I encourage everybody to check out the, the research of the panelists. Um, and particularly, I want to uh, point out Ike Silver, who is my co-author on this paper that I'm going to be presenting. Ike is a fourth year doctoral student in marketing and psychology and can hopefully help me uh, field questions. So with that, I will share Great, can you see? Excellent. Okay, so the title is Put Your Mouth Where Your Money Is, a Field Experiment Nudging Consumers to Publicize Their Donations to Charity. Um, so as the title suggests, uh, sort of the main course of this paper is a field experiment. It's an intervention uh, designed to encourage people to tell others about donations as a means of having more impact. Um, but I think beyond this practical purpose, this practical point, I think that considering whether to share or talk about your donations to charity uh, reveal an interesting tension about what it means to be generous. So to begin, I'd like to do a quick thought experiment. So if all of you could just think inside in your own heads, in your own minds, uh, imagine yourself, imagine you've, you've just donated to a cause that you support, that you care about, and you received a message from the organization asking you to share about it with your family and friends. So think about what what you what would go through your mind. So what, what would you do here? Would you share? Would you not share? Um, do you think you should share? Another way to another conversion of this uh, thought experiment is forget about the prompt for a second. Just just think more generally about your feelings about talking to other people about your positive moral acts, like donating to charity. Okay, so some reasons why you might not do this, say no to this request. Um, well, there's a lot of religious and social moral prescriptions that uh, argue that, that, that real generosity, real altruism should, shouldn't be publicized. It should be private, it should be anonymous. So this is from the New Testament. Matthew says that when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. In Judaism, Maimonides talks a lot about generosity. And so in this quote, he says, in the holy temple, the righteous give in secret. These uh, religions, these particular religions or any religion is not your cup of tea. Uh, you can also uh, look to Jay-Z. Um, in one of his songs, he argues also that the purest form of giving is anonymous to anonymous. This image here is from an article in the New York Times written by the theater critic Charles Isherwood when he was reviewing the new building, the new home of the Shakespeare Theater Company in Washington, DC several years ago. And he's describing the building, which is covered in names of wealthy benefactors who have you know, paid a price to uh, a donation to this, to this uh, nonprofit. And, and um, in, in exchange, they get to have their name on a staircase or a coat room or sometimes even a bathroom. And uh, clearly there's, this is a very common practice. I'm sitting in Huntsman Hall right now in, at, in my university. And we see this frequently in hospitals and universities and, and buildings uh, supporting the arts. Um, there's a, certainly a lot of demand. Uh, people are willing to pay for this, um, but it's also, you know, as, as Isherwood in this, in this uh, article 
uh, laments. It's, it's, it's kind of seems kind of tacky and and um, uh, disingenuous um, to be kind of posting your name like this or avid publicizing your your good deeds. Um, so why all this criticism? Well, at first blush, it might seem like impression management concerns would push us to want to share about our good deeds because being perceived as generous is generally a good thing, right? It's valued in our uh, society, um, but it's 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 more nuanced than that. And that's because people care not just about others' actions when they're make, forming impressions, um, but they also care about the motives behind those actions. And for altruism or generosity in particular, um, people tend to really disprove of altruism motivated by self-interest. Um, so that kind of the whole idea of generosity or altruism is that it is about self-sacrifice. It, it is selfless, right? And so if a person is motivated or, or uh, by self-interest or benefits in some way, um, that sort of taints or, um, or, or you know, makes, renders that, that act less good. And so people tend to be quite cynical about self-interested motives in this, in this context. And publicizing your generosity is one way in which that, that kind of comes through, right? It makes your motive seem insincere. It makes it seem like you're trying to get credit. That's, that's your motive as opposed to um, that you genuinely care about something. And in a, a paper I wrote with Jonathan Berman, Emma Levine, and Alex Barish, we, we um, termed this, the, we call this the braggarts dilemma, um, which is the, this, this, uh, this kind of tension uh, between or this dilemma that people experience about you know whether it's good or not to, not good to share about their their uh, generous actions. Um, so on the one hand, uh, people want to be perceived well, right? And if you do lots of good deeds and you do them all privately, you don't get any no you know no one no knows about it. You don't get any credit at all. Um, but when you tell people about your generous actions, it also kind of raises suspicion about your motives. And what what we found in this paper is looking from uh, observers perspectives of others who advertise their good deeds is that advertising good deeds does does two things and, and they kind of interestingly go in opposite directions um, so the first thing it does is it merely provides information people learn about you through you telling them about your actions um, and that has a positive effect on your reputation um, but at the same time it also signals that your motive is impure and that has a negative effect on on your reputation and so um, the, 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 the result is that it, it, it strategically, it only pays off to advertise your good deeds when people otherwise don't know of you as a generous person. If they already know that, it has no informational benefit and only signals that your motives uh, might be impure. So when we were working on this project, um, we all became, I'm speaking for myself, um, but we all had many discussions about this. I became kind of very self-conscious about self-promotion um, particularly in the moral domain, but in general, and, and, and actually like quite kind of judgy and, and critical of other people who were, who were doing this. And so mind you, this was like 2013, 2014-ish, um, earlier days, uh, while I was, I would still use Facebook and lots of people like me would use Facebook. And at the beginning, Facebook was kind of fun because it was like, oh, I can now see pictures of people um, that I haven't seen in a long time. And that's, that's kind of neat. And then it sort of became, started to feel like, to me, like it was all about self-promotion. Just, it was just really became insufferable to me. I just, I couldn't stand it. And this is, mind you, this is 2013, 14. It was before the election when Trump, the, the election that Trump won. Um, around that time, Facebook became, turned, kind of took a turn and became all about politics. Um, and then it was even worse, but I digress. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thinking about this, I was really pretty critical. Um, but then I started to have a bit of a change of heart. And that came about because I started to get interested in this movement known as effective altruism. Um, so for those of you who don't know, effective altruism is a social movement that is inspired by work in moral philosophy um, that, that argues that the right way to give to charity is to try to use reason and evidence to figure out how your charitable donations can have the greatest impact and then use that to guide all of your decision making. So forget about, you know, what causes you care about or what, you know, what tugs at your heartstrings. Uh, just figure out how you can maximize the return on your investment of your donation. So in thinking about effective altruism and this, this, this emphasis on impact, um, I started to think about sharing about generosity in a different way. So 
telling others can be a way to have more impact, right? You can extend the impact of your donation if you also share about it through uh, what marketers call word of mouth. Um, this is should be a good thing, right? It's a way to create awareness about causes or about uh, generosity in general. It can also shape social norms, which I think are particularly important in, in this um, kind of moral and case where there's it's, so there's a lot of ambiguity around whether, whether and how much people are expected morally to give to charity. And so if people talked about it, we might be able to foster more of a, a culture of, of cooperation and, and, and generosity. And also we know that people tend to trust information that comes from word of mouth as opposed to other sources more. Um, so it seems logical that if you tell others, that should be a way to extend your impact, have more impact. I think also in this particular case, when you talk about charity with others, this typically, if, if not explicitly, at least implicitly, tends to involve a solicitation for others to give to. And research finds that when directly solicited, people have a hard time saying no. Okay, so that comes back to this, this, uh, this more normative question of should you, should one talk about their charity? And the answer really depends on what perspective of generosity uh, you endorse or you're thinking about at the moment. If you're thinking about generosity in terms of the motive, then talking about charity seems, seems to, to diminish it, right? It's, it, it taints the purity of the motive. But if you're thinking about generosity in terms of impact, then talking about charity is a way to have more impact. So with all of that uh, in the background, let me jump into talking about the work that we did. So uh, we partnered with this organization called Donors Choose. It is a US-based education charity. Um, it is, a, the, the setup of it is, it is an online two-sided platform. So it has a format akin to like a Craigslist or an online dating website um, where you have on the one hand teachers who are posting proposals for things that they need for the class. These are typically teachers in underfunded schools in the US. And then donors can get online and kind of shop around and pick a class or a particular project that they want to support. And they can they kind of match with a, with a class. So that's how the charity works. Um, why are we working with them? Well, uh, I met the founder of, of Donors Choose several years ago at a conference that um, Mike Norton put on. I think Leif was there too. Um, that was all about charitable giving and behavioral sciences. And um, they, they to, I'm not sure exactly how this started, but they have collaborated with a number of academics in behavioral science. And you probably have, maybe you have read some other uh, papers that are based on uh, data from them, um, which I think says a lot about them. They're, 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 um, they're very open-minded and they're pretty digital savvy, which, which means they do a lot of testing of everything that they do. And I think that's worked very well for them because they've grown a lot in, in recent years, um, but they're also quite open to uh, talking to academics about um, ways to improve uh, their organization and, and testing ideas. And so, um, so that was great. I've worked with them before, but that was, they were particularly a, a great partner uh, in this particular project. Um, in part because they had this objective of increasing uh, word of mouth, um, which aligned with our interests. And then Ike had this uh, great idea that we might be able to encourage people to think about telling others about charity uh, in terms of impact, and we might be able to uh, help them in, in this respect. Um, so this message that I showed you in the first slide um, actually is, is the mess, their standard message that, that, that appears as a pop-up when so, right after somebody has donated to charity. Okay, maybe I'll pause there before I get into the data. Any, any questions or comments before we talk data? Well, I had a question that was similar to one that uh, somebody asked in the chat as well, and you might be getting to this, but I could imagine that your manipulation that, you're, that I think you're gonna use of giving people the reason that sharing helps the cause also provides a non-selfish 
explanation for sharing. So it kind of helps with the pure motive problem. Um, so I'm curious if you, like as you go along, if you think this is one of the key reasons that you might see an effect, and if so, kind of how one could amplify this, maybe by making it clear when you share it that that was your motive for sharing it or something like that. So this might be a question to also get into later, but uh, but it raised raised in the chat, so I thought I'd bring it up now. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so I will. So I'm, in our data, I, I think that is, that's a very good point, and it's something something we have we have thought about. Um, we cannot, in our data, unfortunately, we can't tease apart whether it shifts people's views about their motive or whether it just kind of points out to them that uh, gives them a good reason to share that maybe compensates for any uh, concern they have about their motive. Right. Um, but I will come back to this at the very end when I discuss um, kind of future directions. Great. Thanks so much, Deb. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the things that we did before our field experiment. So before we kind of, we knew we only probably had one, one big chance with a large sample. And so we wanted to test some of our assumptions uh, going in. And so the first thing we wanted to explore was whether indeed people are kind of uncomfortable with talking about uh, charity. Um, anecdotally, we hear from donors choose that uh, when they talk to their donors and just like qualitative uh, research, market research they do, um, that, that their donors tend to prefer being more private and that sharing rates are low. And so we had a hunch that that was because uh, people feel uncomfortable, it seems inauthentic or, or um, braggadocious to, to share about it. Um, so what we did initially is just a quick survey on MTurk in which we, uh, listed a lot of different common purchases, 21 different purchases. Um, and we asked uh, those participants to rate on a one to seven scale, how uncomfortable they would feel talking about that with peers, friends, and family. Um, so here's just some pictures of, of uh, kinds of products that purchases that we asked about. Um, most of these are, 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 we picked because we figured most people had experience with them. Um, so there's a variety of food things. <laughs> furniture, um, show tickets, things like that. And one of the 21 was a donation to charity. Okay. So that's all we asked, just how uncomfortable would you feel uh, sharing this? And sure enough, um, the donation to charity is among the, 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 the items that people feel the most uncomfortable uh, talking about. Uh, right up there with a stock investment, which is another, I think, taboo subject to, to talk about. Um, note here, we didn't include anything that was like particularly deviant or embarrassing, right? which I'm sure would have higher means uh, than this. Um, so our point isn't to say that this is like the most uncomfortable that people ever feel about sharing about anything, um, but it's, it's, I think it's interesting because this is a positive thing. This isn't a deviant thing, and yet people um, really tend to not feel comfortable uh, talking about it. Um, they're concerned about the reputational consequences, perhaps, or, um, or just maybe for themselves, they want to believe that their actions are, are pure and sincere, and, and uh, talking about it changes that. Uh, Deb, I have a quick question. Is, it, uh, is there heterogeneity in those responses? Like some people saying one and some people saying like a seven, so the mean kind of goes close to four. It's like kind of homogeneous how people respond. I don't remember. I, do you have any? insight about no, that off the top of your head? No, no, I was just uh, curious, like, because the implications of this are different, right? So there are some people who really dislike doing it and some people who really uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Right? So there are definitely some people who think that bragging uh, about their charitable donations or broadcasting, it might have positive, uh, might have a positive impact on their reputation. And you might expect that for those people, they would be less uncomfortable. So there is some heterogeneity and it seems like that heterogeneity probably depends on what kinds of predictions you're making about how others will respond. Um, they will have more data on that particular question, how people respond on average in the next experiment. Yeah, yeah, good. Yes, I'll come to this, come back to this in just a second, although I, I don't, I don't have, we don't have all the answers yet on that. To one, one quick question. It's interesting that the response for the donation stock investment are almost the same. Um, do, you, do you have any explanation for that? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I, I, I think it makes sense that they're more, uh, they're, it's more uncomfortable to talk about those than the others. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, they're both taboo, perhaps for different reasons. 
So just to um, add, sorry, just eyeballing it in terms of the other question, you guys would know better than I do, but it doesn't look like the variance from your bars is all that different for donations than for some of the others. So it doesn't at least suggest that there's like a, a huge effect with donations having like this massive like spread of people where the other Correct. categories don't. I don't know if that's uh, accurate to what you saw. But. Yes, yeah. So in our in a lab study, which I'm gonna go to in one sec, uh, we'll come back to this this point that Ike raised about, it, it is possible that, that um, some people or some of the time people are thinking about positive consequences of talking about their generosity as well as as well as negative. Um, so let's let's go there. Okay, so this was a study also to just give us some insight before we launched our field experiment about uh, what people might be thinking about and whether we could get them to think a little bit differently about sharing about charity. Um, so we did this in the lab. Uh, we had all of our 377 participants write down the name of a cause or a charity that they personally cared about. We asked them to imagine making a donation to this charity. And then we asked them to imagine receiving a follow-up email from the organization with a request to share about the cause on social media. Okay, so there, that, at that point, we randomly assigned them to one of three conditions in which we try to, try to reorient them to think about different consequences of sharing. So in the first condition, uh, we asked them, how will posting about your donation impact the cause? Second condition, how will posting about your donation impact how others view you? And then we have included a baseline condition as well, where we simply said, what comes to mind in thinking about whether to post without prompting either of these, um, these reasons. Now our DV in this study, our, our one pre-registered DV is, is a measure in which we, so after they've written, written their response to this question, they merely answer a seven point scale on how likely they would be to, to share about it. Okay. Um, so here are the key results. When we ask them to think about the consequences for the cause of sharing, they're more likely to share than when we ask them to think about the consequences for their reputation. Um, so in line with the fact that consequences for the cause are unambiguously positive, right? Um, in terms of reputation, I've been focused on the negative ones, but as we, we discussed, it's possible there are also some positive ones, but on average, um, people are less likely to share when they think about their reputation, when they think about uh, the cause. And interestingly, the baseline condition is pretty darn similar to the consider the consequences for your reputation condition, um, which suggests that when we don't prompt them to think about that consequence, they're probably already thinking about that, or that's, that's consistent, at least with the way they're, they're thinking about it when we prompt them um, to think about the reputation. Uh, now, this uh, was not, this is more exploratory. We didn't pre-register this, and we're, we're actually doing a lot more coding of their responses right now, but I don't have that data yet. Um, but we did a little bit of preliminary peeking and at, the, um, at what people said in the baseline condition without such a prompt. Um, so here are some cherry picked quotes um, that I think are, are informative. Um, so one person said, it seems self-serving when the act of donating is supposed to be selfless in order to be good. I feel like it is not something to openly brag about. You should just do it, do good in silence. It's a bit preachy, like look how great and charitable I am, puts a bad taste in my mouth. And my favorite is somebody actually wrote, I never post just to flex my ethics. Um, so those are just a couple of them, but we did look at, uh, we had kind of did a very rough coding of how many of them, these responses were focused on um, consequences uh, for, for or not just consequences, but anything relating to the, the actor, right? Um, how the actor would feel or, or would be perceived by others um, versus uh, uh, those that had a, more of a focus on, on the cause. And at least there, uh, the 63% mentioned something that focused on the sharer, and only 35% mentioned something that focused on the cause. And so it seems that more people, without any prompts, are, are worried about how this this um, worried about how this seems to them or to, to others in terms of, of of the motive of their of their action. Okay. So uh, that gave us some, uh, a, a, I think, some confidence 
that we might be able to influence sharing. Um, this is obviously hypothetical, um, and um, people here know they're in a study, of course, um, but it gave us some confidence that we might be able to um, uh, message uh, people, actual donors, um, in collaboration with, with Donors Choose and encourage them to think about the social impact of sharing. Um, so um, just to summarize so far, these results suggest that most donors aren't naturally thinking about how sharing can impact the cause, or at least that's not the main thing they're thinking about or what comes to mind automatically. Um, when we point it out, more people express a willingness to share. And I think there's a few, uh, more than one reason why this might be the case. And this, I, I don't have it on the slide, but I think Bethany's uh, earlier question comes, comes is, is, is useful to think about here as well. Um, so why might this uh, influence sharing? Um, one is, is, is very simple. It's just, it reorients their attention away from how it affects them or towards uh, consequences for the cause. Another is, is more in line with consistency pressures. It's kind of like a foot in the door effect, but not exactly. Um, so a traditional foot in the door effect, you know, you manipulate whether people first engage in some attitude consistent action, manipulate, you vary that, and then you ask them to comply with some request that's also consistent with that attitude. And what they find is that when people have already acted in an attitude consistent way, it's harder for them to say no, or they're more likely to comply with that latter request. Now, in our case, we're targeting people who have all just donated. So they've all kind of done that, you know, action one, if you will. And now they're being asked to share. Okay. Um, but what we're going to vary here is what our, or our uh, experimental manipulation here is what it's doing is it's, it's kind of reframing what sharing is about and making it more consistent with the original action that people have done. So people have just given to this charity that they you know, believe they care about and now they're told that sharing is a way to have even more impact. Um, they might feel some consistency pressure there. And I don't have it here, but I'll add it as a bullet the next time I present this, if I present it again um, to Bethany's point earlier, is that it could make them feel different about their motive. It could kind of um, make them believe in some way that their motive is more, more pure, that they're, they are after all, they're, they're, they're you know, doing it for the right reason after all, even if you know, whatever their true mo underlying motive is. Okay, so back to this uh, message that I showed you before. Um, so Ike and I um, kind of, Ike's a better wordsmith than me, but we, were, we sort of played around with trying to think about how to write this message in a way that would best convey this point. Um, in a short, you know, pop up, and we had ideas like this: keep helping. You need to share so others will give to you. Maybe that's a little harsh sounding. Uh, if you don't tell others about the cause, they won't donate. Um, and then we worked with donors choose copywriters who are, you know, pros of this, of course, and went back and forth a bit, and ultimately landed on uh, this message, um, which again starts with "thank you for donating," and then says, "Your donation can start a chain reaction." but only if you tell others about the cause. Multiply your impact by sharing this project with family and friends. So this became our treatment message in the field experiment. Yep, just one quick question. What exactly happens if you click on those links? Um, is there like a predefined message? And what, what does this predefined message uh, say? But maybe you'll talk more about this later. I'm getting right, I'll, I'll be there in one second. Yeah. Okay, so uh, how did the field experiment work? So we conducted it over a period of five weeks. Um, we were able to, to and so basically every single person that made a donation in that time period was part of our sample and that was over 80,000 donors. Um, here's what it looks like. So they, uh, they go to the, the website, uh, they choose a project that they were a classroom that they wanna support, they pay, with their credit card at that point the donation is complete and and they're randomly assigned to one of our two treatment conditions here um, so the control condition is the standard message that donors choose have been using previously it just thanks them like this and the treatment message is the one i just presented to you that talks about that emphasizes that sharing is a way to have more impact okay so we had two pre-registered dependent measures in the study. The first one is simply click through. Do they click on any of these links? Okay, um, that's our, you know, that's what we're expecting to influence by this manipulation. 
people's willingness to share. So click through is sharing. We also, one neat cool thing about this data is that if a donor clicks on the link, they get a unique shareable link, right? Which enables us to track the impact of sharing. So whether a particular person shares, we can then trace subsequent donations back to that donor. Okay. Um, so our second DD we call recruitment. This is also a binary. So this is simply, is sharing having any effect on subsequent donations? Are people able to recruit any other uh, future donations by their share? Um, this is pretty conservative, but I think it's important for us to, to, to test it this way. We can also look at how many other people uh, donate or, uh, as a result of a, as, as a result of somebody sharing. We can look at how much money is donated and I can show you, I will show you those numbers um, in just a second. Um, but we do not have any predictions about how uh, our manipulation will influence like how persuasive people are when they're sharing. Um, that's sort of a, a separate a separate question, I think. And so um, we wanted to just focus on does this increase sharing and does sharing matter at all? But I will show you the other data when we get there. Okay, so to Lucius's question before, this is what happens when, when somebody clicks on one of those links. It depends on which flat, which, how they decide to share. And um, one kind of messy thing about this data is that um, uh, I showed you that the, there were options to share via email or via Facebook or Twitter. And that's what options appear on that depend on whether people are using their mobile phone or a desktop. And they also changed it over time. And we actually don't have access to how which channel people share through. So we're sort of aggregating across any sharing. Um, but we do know here, we, we, what I'm showing you here is what it looks like when somebody chooses to share and it, and it varies depending on, on, on which platform they're in. Um, so on Facebook, um, you see a little like thumbnail image of the project that, that they donated to. And then you, you don't have any uh, kind of template message. You type your own message uh, just as you see on the screen there. Um, whereas with email and Twitter, um, there's, there is a, a kind of a default message that pops up, but, but the individual can edit it if they choose. Okay, so it's a little bit different. Um, we don't exactly know, um, and we haven't, we haven't looked or, or dug into what, what people are saying in their messages um, exactly. Are they keeping the, the template or are they changing them? Um, we're just interested in here, we're mainly interested in whether people are, are, moved, are more moved to share at all and whether sharing matters. Okay, so two identical means. You don't see that very much, but this is a good thing here because this is uh, pre-treatment uh, across the two conditions. Um, the donors in our, in our sample uh, donated equivalent amount, amounts, 80,000 people, so it works out nicely like that. Um, this is just a sanity randomization check that, um, that uh, the two groups are equal, at least on this dimension. Okay, so here are the key results. Um, so the first DV that, that I described was just click through, are people sharing at all? Um, two things to note. One is that the, the across conditions, sharing's pretty low, right? Um, donors choose was right. Most people don't wanna do this, um, either because um, it's about generosity or maybe, who knows, maybe there are other reasons they just don't, don't like to share. Um, but we are able to improve sharing in our message that emphasizes, makes the social impact case for sharing. Um, it's a 4.8% increase. It's, it's not a huge effect, um, but, uh, but there you go. That's click through. In terms of our second DV of likelihood of recruitment, um, we also, also, these are even smaller numbers in absolute terms, very few, very, sharing uh, recruits uh, a very low percentage between one to 2% of, of, um, of subsequent donors. Um, but, you know, that's the nice thing about having 80,000 people, it still ends up um, being kind of a lot. Um, but importantly here, again, we see this, this treatment effect where our message that emphasizes social impact uh, lifts uh, recruitment by 11.6%. Okay, 
Um, so this is just mean donations recruited via word of mouth. Um, these numbers also look pretty low. It's because a large, large majority of them are zeros in this data set because most people aren't, aren't donating uh, from this message. But um, nonetheless, it's uh, a 15.2% increase um, using our social impact message. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but doing some rough like back of the envelope calculation um, on expected number of people if this was uh, to be this messaging was used in, in, uh, throughout the year at, uh, at, at this organization is that it would increase revenue by about $170,000. Uh, um, so, you know, it's, it's not millions, but it's a decent chunk. And uh, it's just by changing some words in, in the sharing prompt. Um, so they were quite, quite happy with this, being able to make this change. Okay, so those other numbers that I promised I would share you. So what happens, so sort of how, how persuasive are these, are these uh, messages? Um, it doesn't seem to matter across, it's sort of no more persuasive in our, in our emphasizing social impact uh, treatment condition. Um, most sharers are only able to recruit uh, one subsequent donation and the, the average amount of, of that donation is about $50. It doesn't depend on um, which, uh, which message they see, the basic thank you or the, the message that emphasizes uh, social impact. Um, and so, you know, one thing to note about that is that that means that the kind of the increase in revenue is 100% is, is coming from um, just the greater propensity to share when people think about sharing as, as a, uh, a means for impact. I have a quick question about that. Is it possible that there's some downside from sharing regardless of whether you're doing it because of the impact or because, you know, um, because you want to share. So from the receiver's perspective, is there still a negative, potentially a negative perception of the sharer that's preventing them from, um, you know, from acting for the Probably. Cause? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one way to think about, yeah, I, we, don't, we don't know from this data, but I, I, I assume so. It kind of goes back to Bethany's early question about do they feel less braggy about it when they're sharing or they perceived less negatively and, and um, in, in this case, um, yeah, my guess is, my guess is they, they might still take a, a reputational hit. So it's so sort of like the price you, you know, if you're a real altruist, like you should sacrifice your reputation a little bit for the, for the greater good is, is one way. I, to I wonder if there's something they can say in when they're sharing to, to get, to at least get people on the same page. I'm doing this for impact or I'm doing this to help the cause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when th I'll come back to this at the end, but we have thought a little bit about if there are, you know, um, if there are other ways to uh, to to talk about, to to brag um, in a way that that have less of a, you have less of a kind of reputational uh, penalty. I just saw that Leslie John has a new article, like a review article on how to self-promote effectively, not, not just about altruism, but more general, generally speaking. And I think, yeah, I think there's, you know, bragging is a bit, there's a bit of an, there's some science, but there's also a bit of an art to it. And so, um, yes, it would be useful to think about how to get people to talk about their generosity in, in, a, uh, in a way that um, doesn't have that cost, right? Maybe that would make them feel more comfortable and also would, uh, you know, inspire others to do it. That yeah, I just have to, oh, sorry, oh. go ahead. Uh, sure. I was just gonna, ha I have a question that just sort of builds off that because I was thinking, like, I wonder if how people perceive the um, sharer moderates the impact of the sharing. So if people perceive that you have impure motives, maybe they're like disgusted by it and they're just not gonna look at that charity at all. But if they think that you have pure motives, you know, they're sort of less distracted by that. Right. Yeah. No. I think that intuitively makes sense. That uh, I, I personally, I think I would be more inspired to mimic somebody that I thought was genuine in their actions than I thought was disingenuous in their actions. Right. Um, yeah. It's it's not something we can tease out here. And in, I think probably in many of the cases, people are just sending these like standard messages, and we don't know the relationships that they have with other people. Part of this, I think, also depends on. In, in, in many settings, depends on the relationships between people who are talking, 
who's talking to who, right? So when you know, like, I know you, Shireen, if you told me something, um, I, I have this like background knowledge about you that is gonna make me make it hard for me to, uh, to, to see it in a negative light. Um, but, you know, for other people, I might, I might view that what they say, the same, the same words in a bit more cynical, in a more cynical light. All right. Presumably, there might also be a lot of people who just don't want to share it with those links and those buttons. So they might just share it actually worked uh, mouth to mouth or uh, they just they just share a standard link someone online. Of course, you can't capture this in both of your studies. Well, and then it, uh, so there, there are two things here. First, some people might not share it with those links that you have that, that you give to them. And then second, uh, some people might pick up on it, but then I, they don't click on that link, but they just go to the website directly and you can't capture that as well, right? But Correct. this is probably not going to affect your effect size, but it just shows that maybe the base rate of is maybe a bit higher than what, 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 you, what you capture here. True. Yeah. So it could be that the base rate is, uh, is higher because we're, you're right, we're not capturing, capturing every form of natural sharing, but it doesn't involve clicking on that uh, digital link. Um, but in terms of the effect size, I think that it, it only suggests that our effect size is, is more conservative because it's not, it's not tapping all of that. Um, which kind of, I think, relates to this slide, which is that, yes, we cannot, in the field in particular, we can't um, measure and everything. And so I'll just offer some very speculative, unmeasured benefits of increase, increasing sharing beyond what we can see in the data in line with um, Lucia's point. Um, so one is that organizations Yes, they want money and they want it now, but they also have uh, objectives of just growing their donor base. That's good for them in the long run. It's more people they can market to and more revenue they can continue to generate. And so this, by increasing sharing, we're, we're um, kind of increasing their, their, potentially increasing their donor base. We see, I guess we see a little bit of that. Uh, we just don't know that, we don't know the long-term consequences of that, but we can speculate that they're positive for the organization. And the other is, is, is a, um, more related to the shares themselves, um, which is that shares may end up feeling more invested to the cause after they, because they share, right? It's, it's sort of like a signal of commitment that um, might uh, lead them to, in the future, to, uh, to, to act, to, 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 to do more because, you know, they've, now they've kind of announced it or made a, made a public commitment in, in some way to this, to this um, cause. But as I said, we can't measure these things, but um, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully there's even more, more benefit out there. Okay, so to summarize, uh, many donors are reluctant to talk about their charitable deeds. When deciding whether to talk about them, when prompted at least, they seem to pay more attention to their motives and the reputational consequences um, relative to the weight they put on the potential consequences uh, for the cause. When we direct their attention to the benefits for their cause, we increase sharing, um, which results in raising more uh, revenue for the organization. Uh, Deb, can I ask a quick question? Can you go back? So just on the second point, I mean, this was raised a little bit in the, in the Q&A, mostly by uh, Shoshana Siegel or Segal, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but it's about, but basically is how generalizable is point number two to say other kinds of donations that people give? Like you can imagine if, if people are giving to Joe Biden in 2020, maybe they are really focused on the cause and they're not really focused on like any negative reputational consequences for sort of telling the world about that kind of donation. So do you, do you have a sense for like when this is going to be, like, like, like basically when, when this may not be the case, like when, when people actually might, be, might have the cause as being sort of more salient than the reputation? Yeah, great. Um... I, I, yeah, I thought some about this and I, I feel free to jump in as well. I think in the poli political donations and also just other pro, some uh, certain other pro-social behaviors like voting, for instance, um, there's less of this notion that uh, this is like this great, greatly sacrificial act like charity is. And so there's, it's, there seem to be less, my, this is my impression, I haven't measured this, but there seems to be less of a concern about signaling selfish motives. And so, so that's, that's kind of different from your point. Your point is like maybe, it, but maybe they're related. Maybe because of that, they're focused more on, um, more on, on the impact 
Um, I also think another difference is in that case is that that's something that people talk a lot about, right? Um, during elections. And so that might, it, it may have, it's possible that it's just become kind of more normalized to have those sorts of uh, conversations um, than it is for the case of charity. Uh, I, those are just my speculative thoughts. I, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think I agree with most of what you said. Um, at least anecdotally, though, it does seem like when people are accused of sort of virtue signaling or like empty, uh, empty words, empty gestures, it's often in the domain of, uh, of politics. So like if you, you know, follow the discourse on Twitter, people who get accused of virtue signaling are often talking about some political issue uh, as opposed to talking about charitable donations per se. Now, obviously, that's just sort of an anecdotal observation, um, but it does seem like that there at least are these kinds of reputational risks, i.e. being thought of as posting for the wrong reasons or talking with the wrong motives uh, in the domain of politics. So, so that aspect of it seems like it might be generalizable. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So around certain political issues, like when everybody is, is posting about Black Lives Matter, especially when you've seen it like a thousand times, it starts to seem sort of insincere and virtue signaling-ish. Um, uh, as opposed to, I think, what Joe brought up, which is like a supporting a, particularly like a presidential race, which tends to attract a huge amount of attention and you're, there's a strong social norm, at least in our social world of being involved and, and engaged. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to think more about, you know, different, different domains and where, what, yeah, what the boundary conditions are, I guess. Okay, so, and this is, I, I kind of, we kind of gone over this already, but this was really, I think Bethany's original um, question at the beginning of the talk, which is that uh, this, it's, it's possible that this is, this intervention isn't really doing anything for um, people's reputational concerns. They might still be worried, you know, one possibility is they're still worried about appearing uh, uh, braggadocious or, or and it might actually, and that worry might be um, borne out, right? Um, and they're just, those who are who are switching, if you will, to to or deciding to share because of impact, may, might just be kind of waiting impact over this. Or it's possible that once they start thinking about impact, that gives them kind of a license to be uh, more boastful. Um, another another idea. This is like totally um, credit Ike 100% here. Um, so so there's other things that we might think about as interventions that target this this uh, more directly. And so Ike has, calls these self-effacement appeals. And for example, um, things like uh, Movember, which is where you like grow really bad facial hair for a cause um, and then post about it a lot to, you know, to get attention. Uh, or likewise, the ice bucket challenge where you videotape yourself and show, show yourself dumping ice on your head. And so what's cool about these, these I know they're, they're kind of silly and entertaining, but it's also like by, by doing something kind of embarrassing or that makes you look kind of bad, that might sort of compensate for, for the bragginess of the action in, in, a, in, a nice, in a nice way that seems to work, um, at least anecdotally. Um, so I think it's useful to think about, as, as some of you brought up, like other ways that we might encourage uh, more people to talk about this. I know, you know, personally, I still have a really hard time. I'm still like uh, plagued by thinking about motives when I, when I think about this stuff. Um, but I think as a society, it would be useful, um, I think, to, to encourage this more. Um, Deb, uh, I like this a lot. And if, uh, one other suggestion I had is, is actually closer to what you already did, which is maybe you're about to get to this in terms of future directions, but it would be interesting if the message about cause carried forward in your share so that other people who saw your share also saw this idea that sharing helps the cause, because I feel like that would address partly this motive concern or this um, bragging concern where other people who see my share now could perhaps assume that I'm sharing for this reason about the cause. Um, and that might help with the reputation. It would also have a second effect, which it kind of like passes your manipulation on to whoever sees it next. So it actually would have that effect potentially too of, of encouraging the next group of people to share. Um, but, I, but I think it might directly or even manipulating that could also see like how sensitive people are to this bragging concern, I think. And, you know, are they more willing to share if they know that this message about cause is something that the people they share to are, or, you know, with are going to actually see. And so they can kind of infer that I'm being pure and I'm sharing for the cause instead of like sharing for, for myself. So, so I, I don't know if you've thought about doing that. Maybe you were about to get to it, but uh, we, I think that might help. We totally thought about it and I don't have it on a slide. So I'm really glad you, you brought it up. Yeah. So, uh, 
I showed you those templates of what it looks like when somebody shares on the different platforms. And it seems like there's an opportunity there to kind of play around with the language to, to kind of diminish these uh, concerns, as, as Bethany uh, nicely said. Um, uh, within the, you know, the constraint of uh, this is communication, so it has to be like short enough that people actually notice it and make, it make sense of the sort of the psychological game theory of like, what will the other person think if I send it? And, you know, so um, I, I think it's a great, a great idea. I haven't, we haven't quite figured out how to, how to do that, but um, I'd like to think more about it. So One more quick thing on that, Deb. I'm not sure if you remember this, but when we first started working with Donors Choose, I spent a couple of weeks emailing back and forth with Stephen, asking about different aspects of their platform that we could manipulate. And one of the primary things we wanted to be able to do was see if we could uh, control the default message that they supplied people with, thinking that if you sort of help people craft messages that diminished bragging attributions and emphasized the cause, we might be able to get people to share more and recruit more. But they were sort of very protective of that aspect of their uh, of their platform. So we just started with the, the sharing ask. Maybe that's what, where to let us go next now that we've sort of demonstrated our worth. Great, thanks for that, Ike. Yeah, maybe we find, maybe we can find a, another organization who's open to letting us do that, but um, good. Okay, I think that is all I have. Thank you, uh, panelists. Thank you, uh, Leif, Joe, and Yuri. And thanks for funding from the Wharton Social Impact Initiative and to Donors Choose. We're a great partner. Uh, any final questions or thoughts? I have just one more if no one else is going at just take too much time. But um, one other thing that comes to mind in terms of why people wouldn't want to share is the exactly kind of why it might work, which is that like when you share, you're kind of asking your friends to donate and then maybe they feel pressure to donate and that helps the cause, but maybe hurts your relationship with them. Obviously not a huge amount, but like if you're constantly kind of putting pressure on people to give, they might not be so happy with that. And I don't know, that's kind of separate from the reputational issue that that we were talking about. I'm not totally sure how to address it, but it just comes to mind as another barrier to to sharing, um, you know, why you give is that you don't want to kind of ask all your friends and family to give all the time. I don't know if you've thought about that and how one might kind of counteract that. Right. Yeah. So we kind of wrap that into reputational concerns, but I fully agree that it's it's different from appearing the, the specific reputational concern of appearing like your generous action isn't really generous it's motivated by self-interest right. yeah. um, but it is about yeah your impression management and relationship you know maybe relationship management or, or or something like that and so yeah so this is yes I don't, I don't I don't totally know what to do about that you know one thing we talked about or somebody suggested to me once is that um uh, maybe if they were sharing if they weren't sharing if they were sharing sort of anonymously or something like that which would lower the reputational risks, but at the same time, probably be less persuasive, right? And so yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, as, as, you, as you suggested, like the more, you know, the more you push, the more pressure you apply, probably the more effective it is, but it's also um, uh, the more the backlash, you know, the more that, that more harm to your reputation or your, you know, how other people view you or your relationship. Um, so that's like a kind of a balancing act um, mm -hmm. that we haven't, yeah, we haven't fully realize. Ike, do you yeah. have any th other thoughts on that? No, I think you covered it. Um, I had uh, another thought about, you know, kind of when chairs are kind of choosing to share what's going through their mind. And I wonder if you thought about miscalibration as a source. So even if they do think it will have an impact, I'm going to suffer this reputational um, cost. And I don't think that people are going to be influenced by me. So why accept the cost, right? And so if people are incorrect about that, they may be sort of under promoting relative to what they would want to do. Right. Yeah. So yeah, great. Yeah. So I think like perhaps our message is, uh, is, is tipping them towards realizing that they might be more effective. I, I, it's, it's, it's totally, yeah. I, I think about like, those people that uh, those people, um, the the philanthropists who pay to get their names on buildings and like, are they doing? Are they calibrated? Like maybe, maybe they their reputations are so self interested that they really benefit by showing the world that they donated a lot of money, right? Um, or maybe they're like wildly miscalibrated, or possibly, hear me out. Maybe they're purely altruistic and they're sacrificing their reputation to you know support the. The arts or whatever it might be. 
I mean, you could also think about calibration along the two dimensions, one being the reputational effects and the other being influence. Like I know that there's research suggesting that in general, people underestimate their influence so, so that you might be able to sort of port some of those insights over here. On the reputation side of things, one thing that Deb and I have talked about is it's not critical that people be right in order to experience this kind of apprehension. All they need to do is be sort of thinking about risk to their reputation, maybe among some observers uh, who might react really negatively, even if the overall impact might be positive. Um, but we don't know for sure if, the, if they're right about those expectation specifics. And one more thing, it just occurred to me that potentially bragging might be even more helpful for, for sharing, right? So if I'm sharing a message and I actually brag, look, I donated to this organization, I'm great. It might, you know, I don't know if it might encourage other people to also kind of respond and say, well, I can also donate to this organization. So I'm not sure, you know, so it, it, I think, I don't, I don't know if you've looked at that and that's something you haven't been able to look at in your data, but is it possible given your research and bragging that it might you know, encourage other people to? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, my, 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 my feeling is like the more braggy, the more that's gonna be a turnoff, but it could be like with, uh, back to names on buildings or names on bricks of buildings or whatever it might be, that there is this sense if, if you're like within a particular community, somebody like me is getting some, I see them getting some benefit from this, this action that I might wanna imitate that action to get that benefit too. But my intuition is that it usually probably goes the other way, right? Like smells bad when it looks so egregiously self-interested. All right, I think we're coming up on 1 p.m. So thank you guys, thanks so much. Thank you, Deb, thanks, and thanks to all of the panelists and thanks to all of our audience members for coming today. Really interesting presentation, great discussion. Uh, we will be back again next week. Everybody enjoy your weekends. Thank you. <laughs>